We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Our special guest today is Julie Dobbins, Director of Operations at The Table Group. Julie is a detail-oriented problem solver who thrives working with teams. Her experience in higher education spans from sales and recruiting to team development, training, and event planning. Julie is currently using her genius to help teams use the working genius to transform their teams, meetings, conversations, and planning so they can get more done in less time. What I appreciate most about you, Julie, is your encouragement and belief in others. You truly want what's best for people and organizations that you serve, and it's just such a pleasure to connect with you and we can geek out on the working genius. Welcome to ROG, Julie. Thanks, Shannon. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, awesome. I'm excited to have you here and for us to have the chance to talk about this. So if you could please help our listeners who have not yet heard of The Working Genius understand what it is. Yeah. So Working Genius is a model that is, it's really a productivity model. And we have an assessment along with that. And um, there's also now a book that you could read about it. But really the thing that sets it apart, you know, when I work with teams, a lot of times people are a little bit hesitant because there's so many assessments in the world, right? So people aren't necessarily eager to hear about another one all the time. And so that's where we love to talk about that. The Working Genius is simple. It's really practical. But the biggest thing is that it's applied to work. So it's Mm -hmm. really about how work gets done. And so, you know, I know we're going to talk more about the model, but we have really been able to kind of unpack that there's six different types of work or different stages of work that any, whether it's a project or a plan or, you know, a family vacation, right, that you go through this process to get things done. And so the working genius really speaks to how work gets done and then for teams or for leaders, how do we contribute to that? And how can Mm. we lean on one another to be more productive and more more effective as a a team or um, in our business and even in our family, you know? So it definitely applies across the board because we're doing work in, in all those different spaces. So this is a tool that people can use at work And at home, for sure. But it's a productivity tool more than it is a personality assessment. So what are some of the ways that you would describe working genius as a means to being a generous leader? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many different ways that you can apply the working genius. But I think specifically for generosity, when you understand both the ways that you are energized by work or types of work that you find more draining or more frustrating. And then when you understand that about people around you, right, whether it's the people Mm -hmm. on your team, those that you're leading or in your home, then we can both be generous with, hey, here's the gifts, the ways that I can contribute best. So, you know, for me, discernment is one of my geniuses. And so I really love being able to kind of help assess an idea, um, figure out like, is it viable? And then really be able to refine it and and make it happen. And then tenacity, which is, you know, the process of getting something across the finish line. And so really being able to push things towards completion. And so for me, knowing that about myself really helps me be able to know how do I show up in meetings? How do I lead? Um, Mm -hmm. And then it also helps me bring other people alongside of me who maybe are gifted in different areas. And so I want to be both generous with my gifts the way that I contribute. And then I want to be generous with allowing others to show up in areas where they're really gifted, where they find energy in different types of work. And that way we can be more effective as a team. Oh, I love that. So let's just go off of your first one, the discernment genius. So what would be an example of something that brings you joy? Oh, that's a great question. So I, you know, work with a lot of people who love to come up with new ideas, right? That's something, if you're familiar with the table group at all, Patrick Lanchoni has been doing this for over 25 years with with different teams and with different models. And so that's something, whether it's working with our team internally or working with other facilitators that I get to work with, they love, they love to come up with new ideas. And my two working frustrations are mm-hmm. invention and wonder. So having to think about the possibility and come up with a new idea. And so 
you know, not only do I understand that about myself, right, that's going to be something that maybe is draining for me or not as natural for me to do. But when I work with people who are good at that, who can come up with a new idea, I love getting to be a part of the process of figuring out, okay, is that, a, is that idea going to work or how do we r- refine it a little bit more to make it possible? Or mm-hmm. uh, what do we need to think through to make sure that this is kind of viable, like I'd mentioned earlier. So I love getting to be invited into those conversations and to be a part of that process. I also really like getting to be a part of, you know, I mm-hmm. get so excited when we're close to the end of a project and get to really think through, okay, what do we need to make, what do we need to make happen? How do we get this across the finish line? What are the final things that we need to think through and really getting to push mm-hmm. things to completion and So those are two types of work that are very energizing for me. And I really enjoy getting to do it. For our listeners who are unfamiliar with this model and they've not heard this language and vernacular before, let's walk through the six. And it's really helpful that it's in the acronym of widget, (laughs) which is so funny because in this Uh certification class, I was thinking I was literally going to ask could we create an acronym or something? And then I was like, oh, they've been saying it like the whole time. It's a widget. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, yes, perfect. Yeah. It's already there. Over my head. <laughs> yeah, so it's the acronym of widget. And mm-hmm. if you could just walk us through the six so that our listeners can understand the the details. Yeah, so... Wonder is the first type of work. So as I mentioned, it's a productivity tool, so kind of different types of work. So wonder is the first you know, stage or type of work that's addressed in The Working Genius. And wonder is really about stepping back and looking at the big picture, at what's possible, and really looking at the environment. So a lot of people who have the genius of wonder, they, they enjoy asking questions. They like getting to kind of ponder possibilities. And so that's that first stage of work. The second stage is invention. So invention is, you know, really about coming up with new ideas. It's about being innovative and uh, and being able to create something new or unique or different. And so people who enjoy this type of work, they gravitate towards, um, you know, coming up with new ideas or they enjoy kind of being in front of a blank whiteboard, right? Let's let's come up with a plan. Let's come up with uh, something, something different, something we haven't done before. And so that's really energizing and exciting for them to be able to do. The next stage of work is discernment. And so discernment is where, um, you know, people who have this genius, they kind of, they've gut instinct, right? So when they hear an idea or they hear about a plan or a possibility or a product or something like that, they kind of have this, this intuition of, you know, is that going to work? Is that going to, you know, be successful? Is it, is it possible? And so they have good pattern recognition and they really like to be part of the kind of that um, refining process and being able to assess uh, ideas and, and plans and, and uh, possibilities. The next stage of work is galvanizing. And so this is the, the process of really getting everybody rallied around a decision. So as you know, I've kind of described it, you know, coming up with a possibility, uh, you know, so what usually it looks like asking a question, right? A lot of wonder is ask a question mm. and then come up with a new idea, invent, discern, right? Refine or, or assess the viability. And then once you've gone through that process, then you galvanize. And so this is a, a area of work that maybe people wouldn't have identified prior to the working genius, but it's really important because once you have decided, here's what we're going to do, galvanizing is really being able to rally around that idea or, or the plan or, or whatever you guys have decided. And it's keeping people moving. It's creating momentum and making sure everybody's looking in the same direction. So people who enjoy galvanizing, they really like to be a part of um, casting the vision for teams. They love to be able to be part of, you know, here's what we're going to do and, and really cascading that plan um, or the purpose to, to the team. So they really enjoy that process. The next stage is our type of work is enablement. And so this is one of your geniuses, I know, uh, is that's really the kind of being able to come alongside, being able to anticipate needs um, and get a project moving, get a project off the ground. And so people with enablement um, often sometimes can think, oh, I'm just really nice or or I like to help. But this is a key stage of work because teams that don't have this, um, they can feel like they're either working in silos, there's not enough camaraderie on the team. And so enablement is really a part of um, both, you know, moving something towards the, you know, this is an implementation um, area of work of getting a project um, off the ground and, and getting a team to work together on that. So that's enablement. And then the last one is tenacity. And so tenacity is really moving a project across the finish line. It's thinking through, you know, what needs to happen to make this happen and then pushing a team um, to complete. And so people who enjoy the, you know, find tenacity work energizing. They really like to think through um, the tactics and the details and and kind of the plan of what needs to happen. And then they love to be able to execute. So those are the six types, 
as succinctly as I could do them. Um, but as I, I kind of mentioned that language in there, you know, we, everybody has two areas of work, whether it's, you know, anywhere in, in that um, W-I-D-G-E-T, where they find most joy, energy, fulfillment, they gravitate towards that type of work. That's their area of genius. Two types of work that they find, you know, it's their area of competency. We'd call them working competency. So they're able to do the work. You know, it's not something that they're necessarily excited about doing, but, you know, we're all you know, capable of, of, of getting that work done. And then the last two are your areas of working frustration. So it's the type of work that you typically find kind of draining um, or it's not as energizing for you and it's just not as natural. So, you know, for me, just as an example, my two areas of working frustration are wonder and invention. So I'm not going to gravitate towards work where it's like, let's try to just sit back and ponder what's going on in the environment and what's possible and let's come up with new innovative ideas. That's not where I'm going to gravitate. It's not natural for me. And if we stay in that type of work for too long, it's actually draining for me. I get really exhausted by it. And so, you know, now I've kind of covered the six types and then just those, the different areas that we land in, whether it's your working genius, your working competency, or your working frustration. So that's a kind of a quick overview of the model. So helpful. Thank you. And even those who have heard the model before, that review is is really, really helpful and just how the work works through these stages. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also interesting to think about the three stages. So those, the, there, there's the six geniuses, and those geniuses are plunked into three stages, right? So those first two are ideation. So mm -hmm. why don't we just talk about that, ideation? Yeah, definitely. So wonder and invention are the first, those are the geniuses that are in the first stage of work, which is ideation. And so that's, again, you know, thinking about what's possible, what are we missing, right? So a lot of people mm -hmm. who have wonder as their area of genius, they you know, it's important to listen to some of those questions sometimes because they'll they'll ask the question of like, okay, what are we missing or what's mm -hmm. coming in the future that, you know, we might need to anticipate, right? So they're really helping teams or people or those around them think big picture. And then invention, which is coming up with a new, it's kind of answering that wonder question of, okay, right. if this is what's possible or if this is um, the potential, then what do we need to do about it? Coming up with new and innovative ideas, plans, solutions, mm -hmm to that question. So that first stage of work is ideation. Now, the next stage of work is activation. And this stage can often get, get skipped with teams because it's like, okay, let's just come up with an idea, ideate, right? Wonder and invent. And then we'll implement, which is the last stage of work. And I'll talk about it in just a second, right? Let's make it happen, get it done. But that middle stage of work where we discern the ideas or the plans and then activate, we galvanize, you know, so that mm -hmm. stage is really key because there are teams where they can come up with maybe too many ideas or the wrong idea. And so discerning the idea, right? Making sure that it's possible, that it's a good idea, that it's going to work, that, you know, we have all the resources, all of those things um, is a really important step. And then making sure everybody understands what direction are we moving in? What was the decision? Who's going to do what, right? The galvanizing, activating that process. So that's the middle stage. So there's ideation, activation, implementation, and implementation is enablement, right? So when, when you hear kind of the, here's the plan, here's what we're, we're moving towards mm -hmm. from the galvanizing whether it's the person on your team that's doing that or that stage of work, they respond to that and say, okay, I can help make that happen. I, I can get started. What can I do coming alongside? And then tenacity, getting it across the finish line, right? That implementing mm. kind of um, part of the work. And so all six types of work and all three stages work together. So if you see the model, the visual dynamic of it, it was, it's actually gears because we would say, Every job, every plan, every process, it should be a six-letter job. So wonder, invention, discernment, galvanizing, mm -hmm. enablement, tenacity. Those should be present in everything that we do to be most successful. And so they should all, all of those should work together. So that's where we don't want to skip stages of work. You know, we want to hit all six geniuses and we want to make sure that we know which stage of work we're in. That's really helpful uh, for people as they are moving through the process of work. Oh my gosh, so helpful. And, and the point that you made about how sometimes teams move right from ideation to implementation and we miss that activation stage. Just, I don't know if it's being impatient or mm -hmm. not thinking that that's necessary or who knows what the reasons are, but yeah. I think this is a very important thing to acknowledge. Definitely. And, you know, I know you have the uh, genius of discernment. So sometimes, you know, discernment or galvanizing can feel a little bit intangible, right? Like, 
invention can feel really tangible or really practical, like, okay, coming up with a new idea, coming up with a new possibility. Uh, same thing mm-hmm. even for something like enablement or t- tenacity, helping make it happen. Whereas activation, sometimes it can be easy to miss because it's not something that says you can't document it as easily, you can't mm-hmm. measure it as easily, but they are really important yeah. stages of work for something to be successful. Totally. Yes. And as someone who has discernment in common with me, I notice like, I bet you a lot of people come to you for advice. Yes. Yeah. You know, kind of, right? what do you think? Will this work? What are your thoughts? And that's where discernment isn't necessarily about, it's not actually about industry expertise. It's not that, oh, you have worked in a certain industry for a long time. It's really about that instinct, the intuition, the judgment. And so a lot of people with discernment, they'll ask questions. Um, sometimes it can feel like they're the king or queen of no, like, oh, nope, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, because they just have this, you know, kind of, whether it's the pattern recognition, the, the, the instinct to know, okay, mm-hmm. and this is where, again, since they all work together, it's really important for discerners to be self-aware of, okay, if I have an a, a instinct that this isn't going to go well or it's not going to be successful, how can I communicate in a way that that will be received well? And how can mm. I maybe work with, if it's the, the inventor or the, the person who's coming up with the ideas or the plans, how could we work? We call this an ID loop. How can we loop back and forth between the discernment stage of work and invention to maybe it's just that we need to refine the idea. Maybe it's not that we shouldn't do it at all. We just might need to toss it back up into the invention stage to come up with a little bit of a different idea or um, mm-hmm. tweak and, and, and refine it a little bit. And so that process can be really important. Um, you know, it's not everything in life is perfectly linear. Obviously, it's not like we get to move <laughs> through every stage fluidly and it's, you know, there's never going to be a hiccup. But, um, right. you know, when people come to, to us asking for that advice, it's important to not, um, it, just to know how to communicate that, how to ask the right questions and, and all of those different things. So... Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's so helpful. And for our listeners, we're we're going to have a mini series for each of the geniuses following this episode. So if you're more curious to find out the the two sides of the coin and like how we could leverage that genius and also if that's your genius, how you can be self-aware to not only offer it generously, but to be aware of how that might feel for other people mm-hmm. and you know how you can you know, open yourself up to feedback and knowing when it's like too much. Or, well, that's why I'm curious. I don't know if you've had that experience as a discerner of like, oh gosh, I yes. just kind of shut that down, you know? Yes, yes, I do. And especially if I think it's timely, mm-hmm. like I think if I think the decision is is timely or if it's just so obvious to me what the right thing to do is that I unfortunately behave in a way that it's obvious. And I, and I, that's something I've been made aware of thanks to this tool (laughs) and, um, have learned to ask more questions and to try to express why I think Mm -hmm. something makes so much sense. Yeah. Because sometimes to your point, it's a pattern recognition or it's an instinct and it's not as clear perhaps if they're not seeing it the same way I'm seeing it, which is very likely, yeah. you know, we're all seeing things differently. Definitely. So it's taught me to how to communicate more intentionally and thoughtfully um, and to recognize and, and also know that it may not be the best idea. It's just what I think mm-hmm. makes the most sense given the circumstance or the outcome. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a great a way to understand why I love to do certain things, uh-huh. why certain things frustrate me, right? That, and I, I love the language around the competence, the, the genius, the competency, and the frustration, because it's not that we can't do those things. In fact, when I shared my results with my husband, he thought, are you kidding? You do that all the time. And I said, yes, and it's draining. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, obviously, we've all been able to get where we are because we're capable of doing all six types of work, but are they energizing? Yes. Are they fulfilling? Do you gravitate towards them? Because we tend to, you mm-hmm. know, our skill kind of matches that, right? I am better at the things yes. that I enjoy and that I'm naturally gifted at doing. Mm-hmm. So definitely. Yes. And and the other thing I love about this tool, and it's a productivity tool. It helps, mm-hmm. helps teams to be more productive and it's rooted in, and it actually says it in the curriculum and the book everywhere that it's rooted in how can we find more joy and fulfillment at work? How can we find, like what, this is just like a, a, a an insight into how could we make that time more productive, more mm-hmm. fun and more fulfilling? And I'm like, yes. Yes, working genius. 
<laughs> hits every mark there. <laughs> it hits it all, right? And yes. it also talks about why we need other people. So that, that's where I'd like us to go is, you know, Pat Lin- Lencioni, you, everyone talks about the fundamental attribution error. So if you could mm-hmm. please share with our listeners, what is the fundamental attribution error and how do we avoid it? <laughs> yes. So the fundamental at- attribution error, which is difficult to say, a little easier to explain, is this <laughs> concept that when we uh, behave, you know, for me, I'm going to give an example. You know, if I'm getting on the freeway, I live in Southern California, so getting on the freeway is high risk anyway. And if I accidentally cut someone off, in you know my mind, it's like okay, well, I've got three kids in the back seat, and you know they were in the blind spot on my minivan, and so I didn't see them. Right? It's circumstantial. I'm going to attribute that to my circumstances. Where if someone else cuts me off on the 91 freeway, I am like, oh my gosh, they're a bad driver. What a jerk! Right? They they were getting in my way, and so we I attribute that yep. to their character, to their personhood. And so this is where working genius is so helpful because when we don't understand some of those differences and how work gets done and then how we all gravitate towards different types of work, it can be really easy to judge other people. So for me, you know, I love to nasty work. I love to get things across the finish line, to check the boxes and get things done. And when other people, whether it's, been, you know, in meetings where we're trying to talk through all of those different tactics and details or making a plan on a team, if they don't enjoy that, if they're not gravitating towards it, you know, I used to work with someone where we'd get to that point in the meeting and he would kind of cross his arms and sit back. And I used to think, look alive. This is so fun. How, how could you this not be enjoying stuff. this? Yes. <laughs> and I would judge him a little bit, you know, in my head. Yeah. And It really is that we were not, that was not the space where he was getting to operate at his best. It's not where he was going to be able to contribute. And so it doesn't, you know, one thing I will say, this doesn't abdicate responsibility. You can't not Mm -hmm. do work just because it's not your area of genius. But, you know, recognizing, you know, I was judging him and and assigning things to his character that really it was about we were not working in his area of genius. It was his working frustration. And on the same side, I can do this where, you know, we'll be in a brainstorming meeting and, you know, coming up with possibilities and new ideas. And I quickly want to move out of the hypothetical, the possible into the practical. Okay, so what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people who would have just thought she's a dream killer. She doesn't really care about what's possible, right? So they would they could easily judge me for those things mm-hmm. if we don't understand how we operate. If we're not assigning goodwill, right? We want to be generous with how we view our teammates and, and how we work together. And um, being able to really understand one another is so helpful in, you know, both being effective and productive and all of those things, but also just some of the conflict or those internal dialogues that can happen yeah. when we don't understand that about one another. So, mm-hmm. Right. And so this gives us, a, yet again, a language to understand what is that in meetings, at work, when we mm-hmm. witness this kind of behavior and we catch ourselves being judgmental. Something else I appreciate about the curriculum and what you're sharing with us is the guilt and judgment Mm-hmm. bits. Could you just share more about how the six types of working genius help us to avoid guilt and judgment? You know, we understand that there's going to be types of work that I'm just not naturally wired to to enjoy. I'm not going to gravitate towards that type of work. It can actually relieve a lot of guilt, especially for leaders, right? For so long, I think we've kind of thought a leader needs to be well-rounded, right? You need to be good at all of these things to be a good leader. Well, we would say, you know, the best leader is a self-aware leader. It's the leader who knows where they can contribute, how they show up, how they impact those around them. Um, and then they, they surround themselves with teammates and, and, you know, leadership teams and all those different things who can contribute in the areas where we might have a gap or a deficit, or it's the type of work that is frustrating. So a great leader is going to surround themselves with people who are different and bring their unique skills to the team. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, on an, on a guilt side of things, you know, I could feel guilty as a leader because I don't naturally come up with new ideas. I'm not going to be um, as excited and, and, and gravitate towards casting vision and trying to come up with something new and break the mold. And so I could watch other leaders who do that and feel so envious, feel guilty that I'm not good at doing that. Um, or I could really judge other people who, who don't contribute in the ways where I find most exciting, most mm-hmm. natural and think, gosh, you should really show up differently because, you know, we tend to always think that our way is, you know, the, the best way. And so this can help relieve both of those experiences that we have, whether it's in leadership or on teams of you know, judging others or, or feeling guilty for um, maybe where we're, we're just not as skilled. We're not as, uh, you know, 
naturally going to contribute. Absolutely. I mean, what a wonderful way to look at a team, right? And when you and when you take yes. the assessment, you get the the pages that describe your genius, but then that last page, I would say, doesn't really make a full picture until you're doing it with a team because you get mm-hmm. to see on the team how many people do uh, have these certain geniuses, how many have these frustrations, where are their gaps, what does that mean for us, are we mm-hmm. going to be leaning one towards the other, you know, um, I just think like that whole, seeing the whole picture and then looking at it, not with guilt, thinking I should be all things, yep. right? Because I Definitely. think that is what we otherwise think to ourselves and mm-hmm. that we're not being judgmental about ourselves or we're all, or others, you know, for the things that they're being um, attracted to or the ways in which they want to contribute. Yes. And it's so, you know, helpful, like you said, it just looking at it in a team setting or, you know, even like if you, you know, if you have a spouse at home who, you know, even in that setting, you, there's no way to cover all six geniuses, right? And so mm-hmm. knowing that we're all going to show up differently when you can understand that and you, you'd you mentioned just a shared language of, okay, this explains mm-hmm. why, you know, my husband and I both have invention as a working frustration. So we don't want to have to come up with new ideas for things for our family to do on the weekend or where are we going to vacation, right? That's just not, we would rather not see what other people are doing and then <laughs> try to copy that. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, when you understand that again about how your team shows up, some of those things where it felt maybe prior to understanding something like the working genius, it could almost feel like an internal conflict that you guys had or, you know, in meetings when Mm -hmm. someone, like I mentioned, is trying to brainstorm and you've got a well-meaning tenacity person who all they're asking about is the tactics. And it can feel a little bit like, wait, that's not the type of work we're doing right now. That's not the stage of work that we're in. And so that could almost cause an interpersonal conflict if you don't understand, oh, this is, we're just talking about different types of work. So Mm -hmm. let's have that shared language. Let's get clear, you know, where are we? What stage of work are we in? And so when you understand that about one another, when you understand the stages of work and then how we show up, you can actually have some of those conversations with a lot more ease because you have a shared language and it feels less personal. It's like, Mm -hmm. I can, I can, you know, regulate and recognize, okay, this actually isn't the time for me to ask a bunch of tenacity questions. I'll ask those a little bit later when we're not trying to come up with possibilities. And so, yeah, there's so many dynamics that it can really relieve for teams. So for those who are interested in learning more about the working genius model, please reach out to one of us and find out more because what Julie's referring to in the model we call altitude. So there's like high level thinking, like wonder, highest level, looking out at the landscape and the future possibilities, all the way down to the nitty gritty details of tenacity. And it's an interesting model to help us organize our meetings, to recognize what kind of conversation we're in, to know where we can add the most value, and that we're going to want the conversation to go to the altitude that we feel most comfortable in. So I'll leave it at that, that it's just more interesting information for us to dig into and understand about how we can be productive together collaboratively. Um, so thank you for that overview, Definitely. Julie. Yeah, I know there's so many different dynamics to the model. So they're really, it's it's like I said at the beginning, it's simple, you know, the six types of work, but there's so many different layers and kind of facets of the model. So I'm curious though, I know we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, how do you feel like it's helped you understand whether it's how you show up in meetings or how you work with your team? Because I know for all of us, we've had some of those aha moments around, mm. yeah, how it explains how we work. Yes. Oh my gosh. So many. Um, well, there's a couple, I had a team offsite last week and there was three things that happened that made me see my genius. One is I remembered going to this location in the past and that it was difficult to find. And then I went there and I got there early, like always, (laughs) and it was really (laughs) difficult to find. And even the room itself was was difficult and there was no signage and there was no one there. So I went back to my car and I video recorded myself walking to the the venue and said, and then you're going to see this sign and then you're going to see this. And I sent it to the whole team and I was like, oh my gosh. there we go. There's my enablement right there. Like yes. I'm just, I'm really trying to make it easier for people to do the thing that they want to do. And you're um, anticipating, like anticipating yeah. the need and then being able to solve for exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then the conversation, what we were actually talking about working genius. So it was perfect because we could be overt and use this language and framework. Um, and so they were brainstorming a bunch of ideas and with discernment. 
and I have worked with this team in the past. So I, I kind of uh, back to pattern recognition and, and thinking about how their work plays a bigger role in the strategy of the whole organization. I was trying to be not directional, but but asking them questions to help them see some of the things that I was seeing. And mm-hmm. I was doing it really intentionally. And then because I lack tenacity, we were doing this start, stop, continue exercise, which we have done in the past. And I know that I always fall short at the very end. We get all this great <laughs> stuff and we're clear, but then it's like the, what's the next step? Like who owns what, who's doing what? And thank God there was one person um, in on the team who has that as her number one. And I'd reached out to her ahead of time and I said, would you be willing to, when we're doing the start, stop, continue exercise, would you be willing to help us cross the finish line? Because mm-hmm. I know I, I always get us re- close, but I don't get us over it. And it's got to be frustrating for you, number one. <sighs> this would be a great place for you. To, and she was just like wanting instructions, like I wanted to do it correctly and all this. I said, just yeah, is there a deadline? Yeah. show up and I promise. <laughs> and she got up there, she got her marker going. And now I, my gosh, she had like a name and a delivery and a deadline next to literally everything. <laughs> and it was it was just magic to watch it happen. And I thought, oh my gosh, rather than me army crawling through this mm-hmm. last part of it or skipping it all together, I was able to- One of our to- facilitators <laughs> says, as long as I can see the finish line, that's good enough. And I thought, oh my gosh, that kills me inside. <laughs> so, You're like, yes. no, no, that's not no. good enough. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please, please take it all the way yes. across the finish line. Yeah, and, and have someone to do I that lo- for you. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I loved about that experience was the whole team got a chance to utilize their genius throughout the meeting. And at that mm-hmm. close where she took the lead and ran with it, you could just see them go, oh my gosh, she does this all the time. And she's mm-hmm. the only one on the team that even has it in her top three. So okay. like they really need her. Yeah. And I feel like it just validated her her place and just like the role that she plays. Um, so all of the things that it was intended to do, the working genius, which is to bring more passion, joy, and fulfillment to work and mm-hmm. to be more productive, was able to be played out all just in that one day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. And like you said, just when you understand this about it, about each other and about the people you're working with, you can tap into one another and really be able to, to borrow like, okay, this is the type of work that you enjoy that, and you're better at it than me, you know, to be yeah. frank in a lot of situations. And so to come alongside one another and help each other be successful. And, you know, that's where, you know, we want to be generous with our gifts. I'm sure she felt like, yeah, I would love to be able to show up and do this. This is what mm-hmm. I enjoy doing anyway. And yeah. then it relieves you of some of that guilt that we talked about earlier when you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I know I have to get this done, but it's just yeah. so exhausting and unappealing to me to mm-hmm. be able to do. And so when we can work together and, and use one another's geniuses and be generous with ours, it just makes such a difference. Oh, it makes such a difference. So for key takeaway tips for this episode... I would say take the work in genius. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, I agree. That's, that's my drop the mic take, take away tip. I mean, all of this will make a lot more sense once you do. And just to like give yourself permission to be the best version of yourself. Definitely. I agree. Yeah, that's back to the, you know, the best leader is a self-aware leader. And so when we can understand how we show up, how we can make our best contribution, it's going to make a difference in our energy and fulfillment at work and then for our team as well. Ah, beautiful. Well, thank you for joining me, Julie and for sharing this wisdom. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. Please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.